It's the white cone in the black box. It's the sound of hits. But does the Yamaha NS10 still have a place in 2024? Let's talk about it. Microphones, power boxes, more microphones, shock mounts, more microphones, bunch of film. Man, I really need to clean all this out. This is, this is not good. There we go. That's what I'm looking for right there. Hey everyone, I'm Cool Caparoon. Thank you for stopping by for another video. If you remember a recent marketing campaign, uh, then you know exactly what I was talking about in the intro of that video. Is the Yamaha NS10, or the copies of the Yamaha NS10, are they worth it in 2024? Are we past this mid-range focused box? Has music moved on from this era? The Yamaha NS10 had a very polarizing history. You either adored them and you refused to work on anything else, or you hated them and you refused to work on them. And like most things in life, when something is so polarizing, it becomes infamous. Now, originally the Yamaha NS10 was released as a bookshelf speaker for homes, for, for living rooms, for your living room. It was in a vertical orientation. It came with a cloth grill that snapped on and mix engineers began taking these bookshelf speakers, these home stereo speakers, and putting them in their studio as a more accurate representation of what a home stereo sounded like so they could mix on what other people were listening on and what's really funny is they're not a very good sounding box and so they were pretty quickly rejected uh, by the home hi-fi community they were kind of an epic failure for home stereo speakers but Yamaha saw all of these mix engineers bringing them into the studio and they decided to release a version just for recording studios called the NS 10 M studio Go figure. Now, the original versions of these were meant to be used vertically, and they decided to redesign them to be horizontal, as most of the time these were on a, uh, a meter bridge of a console, and so the vertical orientation usually put them too tall. Most people laid them on their side. So Yamaha redesigned the crossover and redesigned the tweeter and redesigned the box, the branding on the box, so that way they would be in the horizontal orientation. And they kind of tamed some of the upper mid-range that these boxes were infamous for. So the horizontal version does actually sound different than the original vertical version that doesn't have the studio name on it. In my opinion, the horizontal studio version of this monitor is significantly better than the vertical version without the studio name on it. However, they are still polarizing sounding because they have this enormous nasally bump just around 2K. They are so far from a flat sounding speaker, it's kind of crazy. So how did they become so popular and so infamous? There's really two parts to this. One, the sonic character of these boxes really focuses you on the worst parts of the mix. That upper mid-range, that like 1.5 to 3K range that these are kind of harsh sounding in, if you can get that frequency range right in a mix, then it's gonna sound great everywhere. And so because these have a big bump in that range, it made mix engineers focus on that range. And when they focused on that range, their mix is translated better elsewhere yeah, out in the world. But there's another reason why they became so infamous. And it's because of their accuracy 
in the time domain. Now I'm gonna put an article down below in the description of this to an old Sound on Sound article going over the history and the different models and the frequency charts and the waterfall charts of these NS10s. It's a fascinating read. If you're interested in reading more about this, hit the link in the description and go read that article. Between their construction, the way the woofer is made and the way the tweeter is made and the fact that they are a sealed box, there's no base ports on the NS10. They are extremely accurate in the time Time domain. There are very, very few resonances in the time domain. And so what that means is you can hear compression settings with great accuracy. You can hear reverbs with great accuracy. You can hear transients with great accuracy. And that is way more important than a box just sounding flat. Flat is boring. The flattest rooms in the world usually aren't where the best music is made. The very flattest speakers in the world are usually not the most exciting to listen to. And in this room, when we tuned this whole rig, we did one profile where it is completely flat. It is flat, flat, plus or minus 3 dB from like 27 or 29 hertz all the way up. That's boring sounding. And so I've created my own profile in this room to be less flat, to help me focus on the things that I needed to focus on. Now, what that really was, was just mostly taking a little bit of EQ off of the speakers and turning the subwoofer up a little bit. My point is that flat usually doesn't offer the best results. And these are no exception to that. Now, in addition to putting a laser focus on the mid-range, one of the things that both the Ortones and the NS10s do very, very well is checking balance between different elements in the mix. And the trick is that you turn your monitors down really, really quiet. So that way someone typing on a keyboard might keep you from hearing what's going on as quiet as you're breathing. Now this is actually a trick that you can use on any monitors. It just works a little better on mid-range focused monitors like these. But what you'll find is that when you turn your monitors down super quiet, only a couple things pop out. You don't get to hear everything happening. But if you turn your monitors all the way down and you hear your kick and your snare and your vocal and you like the relationship between those three things, then you know your mix is probably headed in the right direction. It's one of my absolute favorite use cases for either of these speakers. Now I went about the first eight or nine years of my mixing career without a set of NS10s. And I always struggled with the mid-range and I always struggled uh, for with mix translation. And of course, like I discussed in a previous video, CLA is, was one of my all-time heroes back then. And if you don't know, CLA is famous for NS10s. He actually has a pair with his name on it that you can go buy right now. I'll put a link to those in the description below. And so finally I decided Decided I needed to have a pair for myself. Now they've been out of production for a long time and so you had to find a pair used. I ended up buying three or four pairs of NS10s. I have a whole tub of spare NS10 parts because they don't make the original parts anymore. So I bought a pair, finally landed on a good pair. These are, these are a very clean example of them and I mixed on these as my second pair of monitors for years, for nearly a decade. Now, shortly after I got my first pair of Yamaha NS10s, I picked up a pair of Oritone 5Cs. The Oritone 5C is like a more exaggerated version of the Yamaha NS10. It's even more focused on the mid-range. It's even more restricted. And they just force you to get the mid-range right when you're switching between all of them. So what I ended up doing for a very long time is running Oritone 5Cs, Yamaha NS10s, and my mains, which were Event Opals at the time. And personally, what I would do is I would spend about 50% of the mix on the NS10s. At the time, I also had Event Opals. I would spend about 30% of the mix on the Event Opals, and I would spend another 20% of my mix on my Oritone 5C mix cubes. And as soon as I started doing that, my mixes started translating impeccably. It was funny, once I got my first pair of NS10s in, I started obviously, as you do when you put new monitors up, you start listening to your favorite mixes. They just made sense. When I pulled up all my favorite Chris Lord Algae mixes, they just made sense. I was like, oh, 
this is why his mixes sound the way they do. Not literally. Uh, it's just a tool that he uses. Obviously, he's incredibly talented. His mixes are crazy, and his gear is crazy. But they just made so much sense listening to them on NS10s. I don't know how else to describe it other than that. And so I worked on them for a very, very long time. Now, at this point, I'm sure most of you are asking, well, Colt, if they're so incredible, why don't you have them up in your studio now? You clearly still own a pair. Why don't you use them anymore if they're so incredible and make your mixes so great? That, my friends, is the point of this video. See, NS10s don't sound very good. They have very little low end. They're pretty scratchy and papery sounding. They're fairly two-dimensional sounding. They have this giant bump in the upper mid-range. They're fairly harsh and scratchy sounding. By any metric that you could evaluate a speaker on, NS10s are not good sounding. But what they did do is allow you to mix in a way that if it worked on the NS10s, it was gonna work everywhere. Now fast forward to, I think, late 2022. I did this huge monitor shootout, it's still up on the channel, and I tested a whole bunch of different monitors and evaluated a bunch of monitors that I had worked on in many other studios. And I was looking to replace my Event Opals with something that was bigger, more powerful, had more low end extension, and was the right size for this room. Because the Event Opals were just, they were too small for this room to use as mains. Now I landed on the Focal Trio 11s, as every one of you watching I'm sure knows. And in that video, I said that the focus mode on the Trio 11s was so useful that I ended up taking my NS10s down. And I didn't expect this because I thought focus mode on the Focals was a gimmick. Now the focus mode on my Trio 11s is much more low mid centered instead of upper mid centered, but it kind of let me do the same thing. It made me focus on the mid range and if I could get it working, if the mix worked on that focus mode, it was probably gonna work everywhere. And so in an effort to have a more perfect monitoring environment, as you can see, these NS10s are covering up the Trio 11s because they're both in the correct position for what they are, but obviously you can't work like this. And so anytime you have multiple sets of monitors, you create compromises for yourself because maybe one of them can be in the perfect spot, but every additional pair that you add has to be in an extremely compromised physical location. And I was getting great results from just the Trio 11s, so I put the NS10s away until today. And my thought process was a couple things. It was a bit out of nostalgia. It was so nostalgic pulling these out. It was so nostalgic wiping the layer of dust away off of them. <laughs> it was nostalgic wiring them up to an amplifier and, and getting out old speaker cables and hooking them up. It was nostalgic listening to them. And yet again, I'm like, yep, I get it. I get why they're a thing. But what place does a speaker like the NS10 have in 2024 when we have so many incredible monitors out there? All of the Focal monitors have focus modes now. The Trio 11s recalibrate the, the crossover in the mid-range as a full-range speaker. The Trio 6s uh, have a two-way focus mode where you can do the mid-range and the tweeter as a full-range speaker or just the mid-range driver on its own full-range as a kind of cube thing. The Focal Solo 6s have a focus mode in which it takes the low end driver and redoes the crossover so it's a full range driver. Very reminiscent of the NS10 sound. You have so many other speakers like Barefoot has their little control that will mimic a cube or an NS10 or a full range speaker. There are so many options out there to get the same kind of focus on that mid range, that same perspective. Who uses a set of NS10s anymore? Now, I think one of the things that NS10s still does extremely well, even compared to all these other modes that all these new speakers have, is if you are working on real instruments in a somewhat aggressive genre of music, rock, hard rock, classic rock, metal, that sort of thing. It can still show you the harshness, the shortcomings of real acoustically tracked instruments, like uh, instruments with a real microphone, dirty guitars, loud drums, that sort of thing, harsh vocals. It can still show you the shortcomings in a pretty compelling way. But for me personally, in the music that I work on, uh, I need to pay much more attention to the full frequency spectrum these days. I still believe that you have to get the mid-range right, but I also need to be able to hear down to 35 hertz. I also need to be able to hear 
up to 20K. Music as a whole in almost every genre has just gotten wider frequency spectrums over the years. It's thicker and more airy in almost every genre than it was in the 80s, 90s, and 2000, early 2000s. So who uses a pair of Yamaha NS10s? Well, anyone who is nostalgic about it, anyone who tries them and feels like they fit into a thing that helps their mixes translate, Anyone who maybe doesn't have studio monitors that have some sort of focus mode or some sort of mode to emulate other speakers. Anyone who just wants to do something different. The Yamaha NS10 that was once in every single studio that worked on any serious music whatsoever. Now you're kind of a hipster if you're using a pair. Maybe that appeals to you. Maybe that doesn't. Now I'll put links in the description down below to the Oratone 5Cs that I highly recommend. Uh, there's also a link down below to a recreation of the Yamaha NS10. I haven't used that, so I'm not endorsing it, but if you'd like to pick up a pair that does kind of this thing, you can get a new pair. I'll put links down below for my Focal monitors that have the focus modes, and I'll put links down below for the barefoot monitors that also have all of the different modes. And if you use any of those links to pick up any of these monitors or any other thing that you ever need, you can jump on any one of my videos, and once you're on my videos, click on any one of the links in the description below. Once you're on the site, you can purchase anything that you need, and it goes a long ways to help support this channel when you do that, and it costs you nothing extra. Those links do go to Sweetwater, so just want to thank Sweetwater for sponsoring this video, and thanks to you guys for hitting those links. Anytime you need to purchase anything, it really helps out a lot, and I very much appreciate it. I'll also throw links down below to these isoacoustics pucks. Uh, we did a whole series of testing uh, where we compared the sonic differences between speaker stands, and we measured the sonic difference of these isoacoustics pucks, and it was a significant difference. What they do is they decouple your speaker from the stand and decouple your speaker from the rest of the room and it helps your room and your speaker stands not resonate as much because when your room and your speaker stands are resonating they are putting off sound and that's giving you a skewed perspective of what's actually happening in the music in addition to that they really help clean up the stereo image the the pinpointableness the accuracy of the left to right stereo field in my experience in my room on more than just a couple pairs of monitors it's always gotten better when i use a pair of isoacoustics pucks they didn't pay me to say that genuinely a huge fan but i'll put links to all of that in the description down below hope you found this video entertaining or interesting at least we'll see you guys in the next one peace <laughs>